Holy One, take our minds and think to them, take our mouths and speak to them, take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. Amen. Amen.
and my tastes were more refined than honey and desert insects. Most who knew me well would think John and me an odd couple. But nevertheless, John came to live in my office and came to be my companion. Again and again throughout my time at the cathedral and then into seminary, and especially during my summer of clinical pastoral education, and through my years at St. David's, the Baptist kept showing up and creeping into my life and ministry. And so you see, somehow this vagabond prophet from the desert and this button-down boy from the suburbs became good friends. That's the funny thing about icons, as I'm told. You don't find them, they find you. And so you may wonder, what was it about John that opened up a window to God for me? Well, it was certainly not his unorthodox entomological appetite, nor his chopping block denouement that we heard about this morning. No, in fact, believe it or not, it was John's humility. And perhaps humility is not the right word when used with a prophet. But it is in John's gospel as well, at the third chapter, where the Baptist tells his own disciples how he understands his role within the greater context of the good news of Jesus Christ. John says, No one can receive anything except what has been given from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. For this reason, my joy has been fulfilled. And then, of Jesus, John says, he must increase, but I must decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease. I believe the Greek word is kenosis, or self-emptying. And this type of self-emptying is not self-emptying for the sake of celebrating some greater humility that one possesses over others. I once heard a priest I know preach a sermon that I called his Isn't it wonderful how humble I am sermon? <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> now this sense of self-emptying this sense of self-emptying we are offered through John the Baptist is a self-emptying so that we might be filled up with Jesus. So that we might lose our selves and be filled with the good news that we are called and compelled to embody and live out. And so today, John achieves his ultimate kenosis. He is emptied out to the point of death. And it is there, in that macabre meal, that we must look for the good news. And I believe if we look deeply, we will find it. We will find it in the contrast that this meal offers us with another meal with which I hope we are more familiar. For you see, I believe that our gospel story today is a parody of the meal that it perhaps chronologically prefigures. Today's banquet in Herod's palace is a satire, a lampoon, a mockery of the table fellowship to which we are invited by Christ. 
Herod's banquet is dismembering Christ's Eucharist is remembering. One meal destroys the body, and the other meal restores the body. And if we forget that the Eucharist is as much about reconciliation amongst and between we humans as it is about being in communion with God, if we forget that, then we have missed the point entirely. This do in remembrance of me could better be translated as this do to remember me, to remember, to put the parts of the body back together. And as Christians, there should be no Herod's banquets. All meals shared, all meals shared should point to the table that is set before us here today. Whether the elements be toast and grits, or fried chicken and potato salad, or bread and wine. When we gather, all we do should be about putting the body back together and never tearing it apart. And that, I believe, my brothers and sisters, is the good news we see offered up to us today through the distorted lens of Herod's banquet table. For Herod's supper shows us what we can be at our worst, while the meal we will share at this table feeds us, forms us, and challenges us to live the good news the best we can, united, so that we may be an icon of the living Christ for the world. Through you, the world will see Christ. Through you, I have seen Christ. It has been a privilege to be invited into your parish home for these past three years to walk this journey with you. We have laughed together and we have cried together and I pray that we have loved each other well. There have been dark days, but the moments of great transformation will always wash away the darkness. I remember the first time someone told me, it may have been in the profile document, that the sheep at St. Francis are sometimes more like goats. <laughs> always butting heads, they said. And while I have found this to be true on more than one occasion, I have also found the goats to be very loving and faithful goats. <laughs> and this faithfulness comes in the form of a community that has deep hearts for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only problem is when the goat-headedness gets in the way of the Christ-heartedness. And so perhaps this story of the beheading of John the Baptist is apropos for entering into this interim time of discernment for this parish. Could, could this body sacrifice its various budding heads to live out 
of its shared heart. Not only until you get a new priest, but until the work of building up the kingdom of God is complete. Hmm. Someone asked me to give you a charge in my farewell sermon today. And if you had to guess, I suppose some of you would guess that I would charge you with building a new building. While others might guess that I would charge you with sharing more of your resources, both your human resources through your gifts of ministry and your financial resources toward fulfilling the mission of the church. Others still might guess that I would compel you to look seriously and strategically at identifying the ministry to which this community of faith is called, while still others might imagine my charge to be about evangelism and welcoming in all those who desperately need to know the love of Christ as it is proclaimed here and perhaps proclaimed differently here. Well, those would all be good guesses, and those would all be noble tasks. And I would be a fool if I did not deeply commend each and all of those to you. But they would all be folly if you did not do what my real challenge to you today is. And that is the same commandment Christ gave to his disciples. Love one another. And don't just love one another as you love yourself, for there are a great number of us who fail miserably at loving ourselves. Love one another as Christ loves us. Love that is that sort of self-emptying love. That love that will make you lose your head and live from a place so deep in your heart that you and others cannot help but be transformed. Now for the cynical and the obstinate, I will offer another translation of the great commandment and my charge to you this day. Get over yourselves. <laughs> Quit fighting about stuff that matters not to the building up of the kingdom of God. Be more concerned about love winning on the cross than who on this dusty orb might be right and might be wrong. And just as an aside, here's a novel idea. Maybe more than one person can be right at the same time. After all, we are Anglicans. <laughs> we don't have to be either or Christians. We can be both and Christians and still hold it all together. And just let me say again, in case you missed it the first time, love one another. Because if you do not love one another, no amount of work you do toward any other goal will amount to a hill of beans. This building, or any new building that will ever be built here, these ministries and any new ministries that will yet emerge, this very body, this will all crumble to dust if it is not built upon the firm foundation of the love of Jesus Christ and that love shared amongst its members.
And there is one other minor or interim kind of charge for you this morning. I charge you to develop interim amnesia. <laughs> interim amnesia. If you find yourself beginning any sentence with the phrase, during the last interim, dot, 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 stop it. <laughs> Stop it and go wash your mouth out with soap. I know memories of the last interim are still painful, but if we think that we are the same body we were five years ago when that interim began, then we should pack it all up and go home. We have grown and changed and welcomed new folks with new gifts and new passions, God has created us anew daily, if not more frequently than that. Spend your energy looking forward with hope, anticipation, and excitement toward what lies ahead and who God is calling to be your new priest instead of wasting energy looking backwards with fear or anxiety or regret. Learn from the past so that you don't repeat it, but don't dwell or even vacation there. <laughs> okay, I have told a story, done the exegesis, shared a joke and a witticism or two, given you a charge, and I'm already well over my usual time limit for a sermon, but it seems as if something is missing. I know. I haven't yet mentioned a television program or sang a song. <laughs> and therefore, I know for some of you, it's not truly a chat on sermon. Now, on my last Sunday at St. David's, I quoted both Willie Nelson and Dolly Parton. That's a sermon for another day. But that seems much more appropriate for the country western context of Texas. And while I'm sure that Little Richard or the Allman Brothers might have some wisdom worth parlaying this day, I decided to go another route and kill two birds with one stone. With one stone. A song from a television show. <laughs> and I have to acknowledge that my inspiration came from words shared at the door last Sunday from Marianne Cowell. And so on this Sunday, in which we have reflected upon the icon of John the Baptist, and upon what it means to be a community that offers itself of as an icon of the love of Christ, I offer you these words from one of my favorite television icons. I'm so glad we had this time together just to have a laugh or sing a song. Seems we just got started, and before you know it, comes the time we have to say so long. But then this song falls short, because we have done so much more than laugh and sing together. This is not The Carol Burnett Show. We have walked an amazing journey filled with music and laughter, yes, but also with compassion and tears. We have bid farewell to some of the saints of this place. And we have welcomed in some new saints as well. We have, with God's help, done amazing things together in ministry, just as you were doing long before I arrived, and just as I suspect you will continue to do long after I have moved on. But it has been a privilege to be here walking and living and loving with you 
for this blessed time that God has given us together. You all have made me a priest in a new way that no seminary or the laying on of hands by bishop can do. And like Mary of Galilee, I will treasure all of these gifts in my heart and ponder them long after I leave this place. And I will rejoice. I will rejoice when the paths of our shared continuing journey do cross, because they will again, be it in the cathedral bookstore, or at Camp Michael, or Canuga, or Greenbelt House of Prayer, or in some shared mission endeavor together here in the diocese, or in some remote location, or perhaps even someday, when I look out one Sunday morning at St. Bede's and see the smile of a visiting Franciscan being back at me from amongst the crowd. I love you all, and you will remain in my hearts is that icon of God's transforming love.